Welcome back to Metabolic Mind, a nonprofit initiative of Bazooki Group, where we're focusing on the intersection of metabolic health and mental health and metabolic therapies, like ketogenic therapies for mental illness. I'm your host, Dr. Brett Schur. Today, we're going to continue our discussion on metabolic therapies, ketogenic therapies for neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. We're fortunate enough to be joined by Dr. Stephen Cunane. Dr. Cunane is a professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Sherbrooke, and he's also the chair in ketotherapeutics, which is a recently new uh, position and, and very exciting, which we're going to hear him talk about. He's published over 350 articles in peer-reviewed journals. He's been the author on five different books, and he's a researcher on, in the Center of Aging. And, and, and Dr. Cunane, it's really interesting because he truly is a pioneer in this field and sort of stumbled upon it um, by accident. So we hear about his origin story, what got him interested in studying ketones, ketones in the brain, and then how that sort of transition to ketones, ketogenic therapy for neurodegenerative diseases. And since he's been there in the beginning, and he's still there now, he can give us sort of the perspective on how the field has changed, but in two different ways, how the research field has changed, and then maybe how the clinical field hasn't changed nearly as quickly and has been very slow to adopt, and why that is, what he thinks needs to change, plus we hear about some exciting new projects he's working on. So uh, I think this is a really um, interesting exploration uh, of, of Stephen and, and his journey through this and what it means sort of for the field of ketotherapy. Therapeutics. So I hope you enjoy this interview with Dr. Stephen Cunane. Well, Dr. Cunane, I'd love to start by hearing what got you interested in, in exploring ketones as a potential treatment for neurodegenerative diseases, because this is a, you know, a huge field with lots of research going on. But when you look back over the past 10, 20 years, probably not so much about ketones. It's definitely sort of an, an alternative approach. So what got you interested in that alternative so-called approach? Well, I guess there's two parts to the answer, Brett. One is uh, serendipity. Uh, and the other was that I'd heard uh, roughly at the same time that I made the serendipitous uh, observation in, in a research project, which I'll come to in a sec. I heard about the ketogenic diet um, in the film First Do No Harm, which was uh, sort of the first... Uh, widely publicized um, uh, way of seeing uh, the treatment of epilepsy with, with the ketogenic diet uh, with Meryl Streep and so on. And I thought that was the craziest thing I'd ever heard about. <laughs> because, you know, like most people uh, in the early 90s, uh, and perhaps many people today, uh, I thought low fat was was important and, and the high fat was going to sort of kill people and all, all the rest of it. Pretty naive view, but that's where my, I was at. And and to, to be honest, uh, there weren't that many people working on even on the ketogenic diet and epilepsy in the early 90s. The serendipitous uh, observation that really made me pay more attention to the ketogenic diet and epilepsy uh, was that um, we, by mistake, uh, discovered that uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids that are in our diet, like alpha-linolenic acid and linoleic acid, are actually moderately ketogenic. Um, and more, more interesting than that, during early development, at least in the animal model we were studying, they were quite important sources of carbon to, to help build the lipids in the brain, which completely blew me away. I was working on omega-3 fatty acids and the uptake of DHA into the brain. And here I was seeing one of the precursors of DHA that was being incorporated into cholesterol and saturated fatty acids in the brain at about 10 to 20 times the amount that was going into DHA. It seemed completely implausible. And then I, I, I learned that the ketones were uh, underlying that process, that they, the fatty acids are broken down by beta oxidation. And some of the carbon is lost to carbon dioxide, but some is recaptured and used in, in lipid synthesis. And so this got me interested mm -hmm. in brain development. Uh, and, you know, neurodegenerative diseases came along in my, in my career uh, at least 10 years later. Uh, but it was the early development thing that, that struck me. And, and, you know, some of the pioneers in the 1960s that were looking at ketones and early brain development have, have all been forgotten about now. But that's, in fact, to me, what was started this whole thing is that if ketones are important for early brain development, maybe that explains in part why they're beneficial for child, in childhood epilepsy. Uh, and when I got the opportunity to move to Sherbrooke, because at the time I was in Toronto, 
uh, had the opportunity to start doing brain imaging and uh, the PET imaging that we started here was, is, was something they, they were quite prepared to try and make the ketone tracer. And to me, that was really an important step forward to look inside this black box and, and see what was going on. We still didn't have Alzheimer's disease on the radar at the time, but as we, but there was no opportunity to study ketones in early development for me. So, and, and since I was affiliated with the Research Center on Aging, I said, well, you know, if they're important for brain development, perhaps they're important for the for brain uh, function as we age. And uh, maybe there's something we can learn about the way the brain is using these two fuels that that would be relevant to healthy brain aging. And uh, you know, it's turned out very to be very interesting. But uh, at, at the beginning, we had no idea where this was going to take us. Yeah, really interesting. That started with that just a, the scientific curiosity of of ketones and the brains and the interaction. And and I, I like that you mentioned imaging though, because like you said, the brain's a black box. How do we know what fuel the brain is using? How can we tell if it's using glucose or ketones? So you had to sort of help develop this technology to differentiate that. So give us, you know, the, 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 the one minute layman's version of how can you tell what the brain cells, the neurons are using for fuel to create energy? So imaging, uh, PET imaging specifically, um, positron emission tomography, um, you can follow different isotopes, different molecules as they're being used by the brain. What you get is an image of the activity of the utilization of those molecules in different parts of the brain. And what we've known since the 1980s, since the dawn of, of PET imaging uh, in human studies, is that, that glucose is, is the main fuel. That was known already. But you can see the pattern. And you can see that the gray matter is using twice as much glucose as the white matter, for instance. But the white matter is not inert. It's not just an insulated wire. It's actually actively metabolizing, making uh, myelin, making the insulation for the nerves. And there's an active process that's involved there. Now, we, knew, we, we also know that ketones are used by the brain. Uh, we've known that since the 60s with um, uh, George um, Cahill, for instance, um, and that during starvation, ketones become a dominant fuel. Um, but little was known about the process in relation to aging. And the big surprise for us was that we knew that there was this problem when getting glucose into the parietal cortex in Alzheimer's disease. That, that had been known since the 80s as well. Even on the crudest PET images that were available 40 years ago, you can still see that that area of the brain is simply not metabolizing glucose very well. And the interpretation always was that those cells are dying or have died, and hence they don't, they're not going to use much fuel, of course, because a dying cell doesn't have any energy requirements. So it was interpreted as a consequence of the disease. And we said, well, two points. One is um, that problem seems to be present. The metabolic problem seems to be present before people are clinically diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So maybe it's not just a consequence, but there are two fuels anyway. And under the right circumstances, the brain is quite happy to use ketones. And lo and behold, when you look at the image for, for FDG and, the, and for ketones, you don't see any deficit in ketone utilization in the parietal cortex at all. Uh, observation that was novel at the time, but it's confirmed by four different techniques now in, in labs uh, around the world. So I'm, I'm quite confident it's a very robust observation. Yeah, so th just a quick summary. So FDG meaning the glucose uptake. So in these, in these cells, glucose uptake goes down, but ketone uptake does not. They can still use right. ketones for fuel. Therefore, they're not dead cells, like you were saying, because they're still using energy. They're just using ketones. They probably will be in, in the course of the next couple of years to come if they're starving. And if you give them the right fuel, they can use it. So the question then is, how, how do you preserve the, the, them, keep them alive and keep their communications alive so that they can keep the brain function alive, the memory and, and the executive function and the language and, and these cognitive parameters that decline uh, in Alzheimer's disease. And so, But that PET imaging gives you a window on that process and it, it shows you where the problem is. If you've just had a stroke, it's probably going to show you that that area of the brain has got uh, anatomically is, is, is different, but also has a problem with the glucose uptake. But it also if you do it correctly, it can show you the magnitude of the problem. How much glucose is missing? 
Is it 2% of what the brain would normally want to see, or is it more like 25%, which is the case in Alzheimer's disease? It's a huge number. It's like trying to run an eight-cylinder car on, on five cylinders or six cylinders. I mean, you know, that's old technology when you think of, of uh, oh, today about being ecologically more responsible with electric cars and so on. But it's a, it, the analogy is that, in fact, the brain is a hybrid car. And what we're getting it to do is to run on the electricity and the battery and, and the electrical motor and bypass problems with the, the gasoline engine, uh, which is what's happening with the glucose. Yeah, you know, it's it's so interesting that the, the terminology is frequently that ketones are an alternative fuel for the brain. And I always thought that that's so interesting that it's alternative. It's only alternative basically because we've made it alternative through our our lifestyle. But when you when you see the way ketones are used, would you say it's a it's a primary fuel or a preferred fuel or it runs better? Like can you use I don't know why I say sort of like judgmental terms like that to say that the brain is the brain is meant to run on ketones more than glucose, perhaps? Well, in the infant, there's not enough glucose getting to the brain to to meet the infant's brain uh, energy requirements when it's born. So they're an essential fuel for about twenty five percent. Ketones are supplying about twenty five percent of the energy requirements of the newborn infant. So they're they're essential for that purpose. Essential, meaning they, they, you you cannot survive without. That's it. right. And the fact yeah. that we're born with fat babies, uh, our species, if they're born at term, if they're born normal and healthy, they've got fat. They've got five to 600 grams of fat, and that is helping to generate the ketones to meet their brain's energy requirements. So it's essential. Now, it's still not the main fuel in the neonate. And, and if that baby's being breastfed, then that's sort of the ideal situation. So now we progress towards adolescence and adulthood, and we're on a typical Western diet, whatever that means. And obviously, it's predominantly carb. um, And um, the ketone contribution goes down to around 3 to 5%. The only way you can get it back up is to really suppress carbohydrate uh, intake. And when, if, you're, if you're on a ketogenic diet, which is, as you know well, it's probably under 5% uh, carbohydrates in the diet, ketones will be supplying on the order of 40 plus percent of, of the brain's energy requirements. Still not the majority. Uh, but what's very interesting is that when you are on a ketogenic diet and you have no problem with brain glucose or ketone utilization, such as in a young healthy adult, for instance, Glucose uptake will be suppressed when the ketones are available. So when you provide ketones, they are, in fact, the preferred fuel. It's it's a term that I I, I know uh, rubs some people the wrong way, but I think it's it's the correct term that ketones, when they're available, and both fuels are available and there's no limit to utilizing both of them, ketones will go in and and will suppress the utilization of glucose. And that's been shown by two different uh, techniques, totally different techniques as well. So I think that's a robust observation. But for the majority of of people, uh, uh, unless you're on a very strict ketogenic diet, uh, glucose will still be the main fuel. And and I think that's normal and that's okay. But underlying your question is, are ketones doing something that glucose cannot do? Um, Are they complementing in some important way? And that's something we still don't know. But when you're born... They are actually the main fuel to make, not the main fuel, but the main substrate to make brain lipids. Cholesterol is quite an important component of the brain. Saturated fats are very important in the brain to make the myelin, but also in the gray matter. And so they are the dominant source of carbon when you're born to make the brain lipids. Yeah, so interesting to think about how it is from birth throughout and then changes throughout life. But then again, at in diseases of aging, like Alzheimer's disease, neurocognitive diseases, that it becomes important again. And and so let's let's fast forward then to when your research turned towards Alzheimer's disease, where so much of the focus has been on the the you know, the amyloid plaques and the neurofibrillary tangles. And like that's been the predominant focus for decades and decades and decades. And here you come and say, well, let's why don't we start looking at energy utilization? and change energy utilization. I mean, there was, 
what did that seem just completely revolutionary at the time and completely crazy to, to some some neurologists and researchers at the time well we, we've always had trouble convincing the neurologists that the, that it was relevant because they they're all looking for uh, sort of the magic bullet treatment to these sorts of disorders uh, and the amyloid seemed to be the, the obvious choice I mean it, it is present it's in present not in all people with Alzheimer's disease as you may know. So it's not a guarantee that having high amyloid may may in fact be associated with Alzheimer's, but it may not. And you can you can have uh, Alzheimer's disease clinically without uh, a large amyloid load. Um, but so yes, it, it's always been sort of um, the orphan uh, approach to, um, to 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 uh, Alzheimer therapeutics. Uh, but we came to it honestly in the sense that we were never intending to, to treat Alzheimer's disease. We were simply looking at the metabolic state of the brain in a healthy older person. In fact, we spent a lot of time trying to define what is a healthy older, how do we define a healthy aging anyway? Um, and what is the state, the energy state of the brain in that, that the person that we've defined as, as, cognitive, uh, as healthy? And, and we ended up defining it ba based on, on cognitive norms for for uh, for normal cognitive performance at, at certain ages uh, and we always found that there was a, a five a, around five to seven percent lower glucose uptake in the brain in even in the healthiest elderly people that we could identify and we said well what's happening in mild cognitive impairment which is the early stage of alzheimer's disease and alzheimer's disease and there's a gradual progression towards a lowering of of, of glucose uptake with with a steady um, uptake of ketones so we kind of said, wow, that's interesting. Uh, if, if the cells are not dead and they're able to metabolize ketones, maybe this can help support brain function. So what are we going to give people to supply them with more ketones? This is around 2012 or so. Um, I knew about the ketogenic diet, of course, at this point, and I was I was doubtful the ethics committee was going to let me put 75-year-olds on a ketogenic diet for uh, six months. And even if they were going to permit me to do it, I, I knew enough about Alzheimer's disease at that point to, to realize that, that they're, they're a fragile population. Uh, and it's maybe it, capricious sounds like a, a little, uh, maybe not fair, but, but they're likely to change their mind. And they might say, oh, yeah, I'm willing to do this project. But a week later, they might change their mind. So we need something that's more likely to take over an extended period of time. And we ended up settling on MCT, medium chain triglyceride, as a supplement. Knowing that once you give the dose, you're going to get a rise in blood levels and it's going to go down. And if you get another, another dose later on, it'll rise and go down. Uh, so it's kind of, um, you, you're making a compromise either way. If they're on a ketogenic diet for two weeks, it's not enough to learn anything about their cognitive function, really. If they're on MCT for six months, that's long enough, but you might not have high enough ketones to change anything in their lives. Um, so that's the gamble we took and, and we came out ahead in the sense that uh, in looking at mild cognitive impairment, we actually showed you could improve cognitive performance in all the five cognitive domains in, in the very early stage of Alzheimer's disease, where there's only a mild deficit to start with. Yeah, so this was fascinating. It was a six-month randomized controlled trial that you did with the MCT supplement versus a placebo supplement. And as you mentioned, there was improved cognitive function for memory, executive function, language, and, you know, one important thing when you when you're dealing with trials is what is the magnitude of improvement? Was it just a tiny improvement? Was it a clinically relevant improvement? So how would you summarize the degree of improvement that the people on the MCT supplement saw in six months? So the, the main improvement that we saw uh, in terms of magnitude was in language, and and it was borderline clinically relevant. Um, so the other changes were also statistically important. They're, they're considered to have a, a decent effect size, a moderate effect size, which is sort of a proxy for clinical utility. But remember, in mild cognitive impairment, they ha they're fully autonomous in their daily lives. They're able to get around, to drive, um, remember their PIN number for their bank account, and so on. So they're only starting with a very small deficit that you can define on these objective tests. So you're not expecting a dramatic change in their lives that you can see in the, when they walk into the, into the research center, which you do see occasionally with the ketogenic diet. As a colleague of mine, uh, Russell Swerdlow at, in Kansas City, has said, you know, I could tell in a couple of my patients that were on the ketogenic diet when they, they had crossed the parking lot to come into the research center, I could tell how much better they were doing. 
So that, that jumps out at you because the ketone levels are a lot higher on a ketogenic diet than they will be on a ketogenic supplement. So again, it's, 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 it's often a practical question and you'd, you'd like to get ketones up to a certain number, but what's the way to do it and what's the chances of sustaining someone on that treatment for an extended period of time? What's your placebo going to be? Uh, and uh, work with the ketogenic diet, but also with the ketogenic supplements faces this sort of um, scrutiny that, okay, you've seen an effect. Uh, what was the control group on? And, you know, for the ketogenic diet, that's a tough call to set up a, a, a controlled study. We were able to, to use a, a control group uh, with the MCT. So, you know, it's a, it's a question of progressing towards uh, solving these sort of practical issues um, that make it credible in the end. And so far, it, it's been promising for yeah, and, and you know other researchers in this space. We we recently interviewed um, Dr. Matthew Phillips, who also did a study on on ketogenic intervention for Alzheimer's disease and showed improvement. So it's clear the the needle is moving that direction, which I think for you must be fascinating to think about when you started in this field, how nascent it really was, and now to the point where there are a number of different intervention studies that keep getting, I guess you could say better, or keep adding to the, the, the literature and hopefully progressing. And now to the point where there's even a chair in keto therapeutics, which is what you are in your new position. Like, so do, would you ever have dreamed that it would have progressed this much and, and this quickly? I mean, you know, some people could say it's been slow, but by research standard, I would say it's been fairly quickly. So I don't know, would you ever have dreamed it would have happened? Oh, you feel, you feel both ways about it. You watch the time go by and the years go by and you say, uh, you know, no one seems to be doing this any faster than we are in terms of getting clinical results published uh, that are randomized controlled trials. So in that sense, I feel good. But in the end, you know, you spent 30 years working on this and you'd like to see it go faster and, and to be more accepted because there's, I think there's a certain resistance, if I could use that word, in the medical establishment. Um, by and large, the expectation is that drugs will be the solution to many of these diseases, whether it's diabetes, hypertension, uh, mental health, in fact, uh, and they're the mainstay. For better or for worse, they're there and they're in your face. Um, and, and so the idea for a neurologist to see, to see or a psychiatrist or a geriatrician to see the disease through the lens of a metabolic problem and to reconfigure the way they think about the disease, I think that's probably the, the, the main challenge ahead now is to, is to get an acceptance that there is a metabolic foundation to many of these disorders and there's a metabolic solution. And it doesn't necessarily involve drugs and their side effects. But if you come back to the original disease that was um, treated with the ketogenic diet, that was epilepsy. And every generation, new generation of epileptic drug that was developed um, kind of set back the ketogenic treatments by another decade or so. Uh, and, but the side effects were often worse than, than the benefits. Uh, and, and yet there's... So many people were frustrated. I mean, uh, the Bazuki family has, uh, went through a period of immense frustration when they realized that there was a different approach to their, their son's mental health issue. It's exactly the same story with that in epilepsy uh, with Jim Abrams back in the 90s, when, which got him to, uh, to produce the film First Do No Harm. Why is, is, there, is there a cultural uh, resistance or a cultural obstacle in, in the medical establishment? Um, and that's something that we have to learn to deal with and, and try to solve. Yeah, it, it's very well said. And if you, I mean, you can imagine the, the two different graphs, one of the progression of research in these fields and one is the, the adoption in clinical practice. And with epilepsy, you know, the research took off and there are, there are you know, dozens of randomized controlled trials and Cochrane reviews on ketogenic therapy for epilepsy, but the clinical uptake was so slow compared to the research. And I think we're, we're probably seeing something similar with ketogenic therapy for neurodegenerative diseases that we see more pockets of people doing research, but the clinical ad adoption is still very low because of this drug centric approach. Um, that, that you mentioned. So, Well, I think Ansel Keys casts a long shadow over the ketogenic therapies in the sense that fat is the enemy. And, and if there's more fat in your diet, we're still, uh, as, a, as a worldwide, we're still um, 
very much uh, affected by that um, dogma that fat is the enemy. Um, and, and so uh, that's something that we have to reconfigure. And, and our older population in the Alzheimer's study, I mean, they were really concerned that MCT is a saturated fat. That's going to be bad for me. I'm going to gain weight. So I said, well, let, 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 these are the results. And the result is that you don't, you don't gain weight. And so it's one study at a time, uh, gradually, but we have society has seen fat as the enemy for the past 50, 60 years. And it's, it's not going to change overnight. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I want to go back to something you said where you said you doubted that the um, IRB and the ethics committee would allow you to put 75 year olds on a ketogenic diet, implying that they would assume it is a dangerous diet and they should not go on it, which is, of course, backwards thinking. Do you think that's changed? Do you think if you went to an IRB tomorrow that they would be they'd be much more accepting of it? Yes, I think it has changed. Um, it's changed because of results of uh, people the uh, People like uh, Verta Health and, and and the acceptance now that type two diabetes can be treated and can even be put into remission, and the openness I think that the American Dietetic and Diabetic Associations have to uh, a lower carb intake is 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 coming. So I don't I don't know whether the cardiologists have have turned the page on, on that yet. Um, that's something you might might know better, but I don't think the neurologists have yet. So there's still a fairly um, strict view of of treatment options and and you know to be fair if i was a neurologist i would have a list of options that i'd be allowed to use that my association has approved um and and the ketogenic diet is is nowhere on that list so uh what risk is that person taking to be ostracized or to even be disciplined for introducing a treatment that is not accepted if it's not accepted it's probably because it doesn't work uh, i mean that that's the logic and, and so we need to change that um, we, and it's, it's still going to take time. Yeah, and if, of course, if the alternative is just to let them continue to eat their standard American, standard industrialized diet, nobody thinks twice about that, right? But uh, to put them on a ketogenic diet would be potentially risky or dangerous from a, a, a medical perspective, which doesn't quite fit, does it, that, that framework? No, and the evidence is there um, that, that it is acceptable because often they, they said, well, it, it might be effective, uh, the ketogenic diet, but uh, people won't tolerate it. And even if they tolerate it, it's too expensive or it's limiting in its vitamins. And, and there's always this search for some other reason to, to not try it when, when, in fact, those reasons aren't valid. But we have this sort of internal psychological resistance that is pretty hard to overcome. Yeah, yeah, and when you, I mean, when you hear these personal stories of how much people have improved um, with ketosis, that all of a sudden it becomes the most sustainable and easiest thing to comply with because of the benefits you're seeing. You don't want to see disappear. So, so many people will do anything they can to stick with it with that type of benefit. And yeah, it's it's um, anybody who says that clearly hasn't tried it or, or or doesn't know enough about it to to realize that it can be incredibly sustainable and easy for many people. But our society is not one that that promotes it, and our society is one that makes it more challenging. So I guess you know it's understandable some of these hurdles. So you have to figure out how do you, how do you change things from a research perspective so that we can get some infiltration into the clinical perspective? So when you think about that and you think about connecting the dots, where do you think research has to go to make it more clinically acceptable? Well, we need more robust results. I mean, my, my RCT uh, had 40 people per group. That's borderline uh, significant in terms of the uh, sample size. Um, but most neurologists will say, well, you know, it's going to take you uh, 300 people per group uh, it, it normally to, to be convincing. Of course, we didn't have access to, to $5 million to, to do it with 300 people. But, but more robust studies are needed. We, placebo is, is, is a, um, an absolutely essential part of, of this process. Whether you're working with a supplement, it's, it's basically impossible to do with it with a ketogenic diet. So um, I, I don't know whether we'll ever have the robust results with a ketogenic diet in, in older in, in neurodegenerative disorders. Um, I, I think the, the thing that that sort of resets the the table a little bit is is um, the internet and that the families and and patients are able to access the information and judge it for themselves and either push their doctors to to agree or or to say that uh, well, I'm going to do it despite your misgivings sort of thing. Um, 
but you know there are companies making money off ketogenic products uh, a, a lot a, a lot of money in some cases and i think there's a, cash, a question of social responsibility to to produce a uh, placebo so the research can go forward to engage uh, some percentage of their profits in in, in research uh, that can be in, uh, independently vetted by some sort of uh, advice, scientific advisory board uh, and and to to make this treatment more credible because at the moment it looks like the wild west out there and it, it's only feeding the concern that uh, some clinicians will have that this is simply profiteering and there's nothing really scientifically valid underneath this. And so I, I think the companies are going to kind of burn, they're burning the candle at both ends. And at some point, they're, they're missing the opportunity to be more responsible and to have longer term view of, of the profits they could make, because it has a more, it's a more credible treatment for, for serious chronic diseases. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, as as we know from medicine, that anytime industry and profits get intertwined with medicine, it becomes quite complicated. And uh, you never know what to trust and what to believe when profits get in the way, which is one thing that's so great about about a diet when we're talking about food. You know, if we're not talking about products and we're just talking about eating a certain way, you know, nobody is going to have a patent on that. And, uh, and, and it fo- the focus is more on helping people improve than really helping um, the bottom line. So hopefully that, that purity can help people understand these results better than, than um, industry-sponsored results. But maybe that's naive. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's a challenging process. I, I mean, if you need to stop... Well, not need to. Anyone who smokes ne- needs to stop smoking, but smoke is not something you need to do except because of the addiction. It's not, you don't need it for, it's not life giving, it's, it's life sapping. Uh, alcohol is not something you need, but food is something you need. So people will have to have to make choices and they may prefer at some point to have eaten more sugar in their diets or more dessert uh, or more uh, pop or whatever it is. And they have to learn to consume less, but and consume differently. And that's that's a psychological uh, and an appetite uh, adaptation that is 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 slow. In an older population, it's not easy to get that commitment, that motivation. How does a 75 year old in a residence where everyone's getting dessert twice a day uh, decide not to eat dessert, for instance, as a starting in, in to reduce their carb intake without changing whether they eat cornflakes, without changing whether they eat rice or potatoes, just trying to reduce their, their desserts, for instance. It's, it's a challenging process. I'm doing it in a residence right now. We started with a 10-day project, and, and we got, we got uh, some very encouraging results, and we're going on to a two-month project now. But there's a lot of, of resistance. Like, I don't, I don't want to have to eat. The, you know, this is, I'm, I'm finally at a stage in my life where people are taking care of me. I can afford to be in this nice residence. Why, why would I change what I'm going to eat? Well, you're taking medication for diabetes. Wouldn't you like to stop that? Some do. Some do don't. I'm sure people with mental health issues, it's the same problem. How do you motivate them to, to make that change when perhaps the only pleasure they're getting out of the day is the bag of chips or uh, two donuts or whatever it is? Um, so it, there's, a, there's quite a challenge. And I'm by no means, I'm not a behavioral psychologist, so I'm not sure the best way to approach these, these issues. But one approach is with the ketogenic supplements, which allows people to eat what they're eating Ideally, they would change towards a lower carb, but they can still get the ketones because the ketone production from medium chain triglyceride or from a ketone salt, for that matter, is independent of insulin. Whereas if you're depending on the body to make the ketones without the supplement, you have to get insulin down. So you have to get that motivation level to reduce your carbs and and so on. So there are different strategies and they're not they're not mutually exclusive. They can be combined, and that's what we're we're starting in the, in the in the trial in the, in the residents uh, this fall is is a combination of MCT plus a fifty percent reduction in carb intake. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, I think we need programs like that, especially in in a controlled setting like that, like in a residence that that can really control what people are eating and really see the impact. Because like you said, when you're getting dessert twice a day and every meal is high carb and that's just the way it is, you, you don't question it. 
And so it takes someone like you to come along and, and question it and change it. And, and you mentioned that you're not a behavioral psychologist, but you brought up some very important issues, which you clearly understand that if you're, if all you're doing is taking, 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 it feels like deprivation. But if you can substitute, if you can take away the pleasure from the donut and substitute it with something else, whatever that something else may be, then you're on the more on the road to accomplishing, you know, a, a longer term success with that. And the hope is for people with cognitive impairment or with mental illness that improved brain function, improved psychiatric and mental health um, is one of those carrots that you feel better and then you can exercise more and then you can engage in in more creative activities or that those are the carrots. I use carrot, but the, those are the, the benefits to- The low carb to, carrots. To, <laughs> the low carb carrots. Those are the benefits to replace what you're quote unquote taking away. So, I mean, you clearly understand the concept and um, and, and that has to be part of it. You mentioned talking to Matthew Phillips, and and I, I know of Matthew. I've corresponded with him, but I haven't actually spoken to him. But I, he's worked with both Parkinson patients on a ketogenic diet and Alzheimer patients. And I'd be very interested to to know whether he had the same experience as us, which is that the Parkinson patients are easier to recruit and easier to maintain. The retention on the study is easier uh, than it is with the Alzheimer patients. They're basically the same age, so it's not age alone. But I think the difference is that the Parkinson patients, if they're improving, can actually see that the tremor is going down or that they're actually able to write something or hold their uh, spoon for their soup or, or whatever it is. I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, and I'm sure that's a motivating factor because their quality of life, it, they can feel the difference. Whereas it, with Alzheimer's disease, the improvement that may be occurring may be perceptible to the patient themselves, probably more likely to their their loved one or the, the, their caregiver who can see improvements that the, per, the patient themselves doesn't even notice. So how do you motivate the, the person who doesn't actually perceive the benefit yet? Yeah, great question. Great question. Yeah, really interesting. That's where, that's where having a care team and having loved ones and a family and a support system can be, can be so important. So it's not, it's not just change what you eat. It's change what you eat have behavioral um, modifications in place, have a support system. It's all part of it, which is a lot harder than just popping a pill, right? It's, it's more involved than just taking a drug. So we can see why there's a higher, a steeper on-ramp maybe to adopt it. But in the long run, probably such, so much more important than the, than this taking medication. So I think this has been a wonderful journey to hear about you and your beginnings and and how you progressed through this field and how the field has progressed. Um, and we hear, heard about your project that you're working on in the residence. So so what else are you working on? What can we expect from you in, in the near future as, as you move on with your research? Uh, two, two things, really. Um, one is that uh, we learned, uh, again, by accident, that uh, exercise helps get ketones into the brain in, in Alzheimer patients. Our, presume that's also true in healthy individuals, but we don't know that for sure. So we were struck immediately by the opportunity to combine the supplement or the ketogenic diet plus exercise. Again, this is not uh, um, a, a, a single silo approach to the, to the disease that ketones can be generated by one technique, but their uptake can be improved by another technique, which would be the exercise. So combining the two, so we're doing a, a pilot study in Parkinson patients with a ketogenic supplement plus exercise, and the same thing in Alzheimer patients. We, we're going to be analyzing the preliminary data uh, later this summer, and hopefully we'll have something to, to say about that this fall. So again, to, to, multimodal, I guess, is the term we would use. And it, the, these things are, you, ketones can't do it all, uh, and they shouldn't be seen as something that um, is, is sufficient by itself. It should be combined with, with other approaches to your health, uh, because even if um, there was no problem getting ketones uh, or, or energy into the brain. Uh, exercise, of course, is, is beneficial for, for, for health anyway. And so it's, it, it's not just one or the other, two together. The other thing we, we're impressed to learn, again, a little bit by accident, is that when you have a tracer for a ketone, you can look at it where it's used in, in the body. So uh, we had been focused on the brain pretty much above the neck, as we say. We decided to look below the neck one day and found that the heart is extremely actively metabolizing ketones, as is the kidney. Uh, and so we're sort of ruminating about what kind of projects we can do to study uh, heart failure. And there's already 
publications out there uh, suggesting that ketones could be beneficial in, in uh, uh, diabetic uh, heart cardiac uh, failure. Um, and so is this a question of, of fuel uh, utilization and fuel strategies, fuel-based strategies, metabolic strategies, uh, as, as for the brain? Is it, is it actually a similar situation to that in the brain? The difference being, of course, that the heart prefers to use fatty acids as fuel and the brain does not. The brain essentially cannot use fatty acids for all intents and purposes, doesn't use fatty acids specifically. So uh, we're looking below the neck and uh, there may be some interesting things that we can learn. It's still a bit uh, physiological, a bit exploratory, but uh, uh, there could be some opportunities there as well. Wow, very interesting. I love to hear all that. So hopefully uh, hopefully we can have you back when some of this research starts to, to play out and you get some results. We'll have you back on at Metabolic Mind here to discuss the results and see. Be a pleasure, uh, Brett. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, great. Well, thank you for taking the time. Really appreciate you sharing your journey with us. You're welcome. Thanks.